One of the world's largest and leading technology companies, Cognizant, dialed up its marketing initiatives as technology's role in powering transformation of businesses and brands becomes increasingly apparent. Cognizant's global chief marketing officer, Gaurav Chan, joins us today to dig deeper into the company's marketing strategies and trends in the B2B space, its partnerships in sport, deploying technology like AI in marketing, and how the marketing function is helping the IT major fuel its sustainability goals. Hello and welcome to CNBC TV 18. Gaurav, it's lovely to have you here. Thank you so much, Dilchat. Some of the B2B marketing, of course, is evolving rapidly. It's really coming into its own. So let me ask you straight up, what are some of the key trends that you are seeing in the B2B marketing space and how you perhaps then approach what you do at Cognizant? Yeah, I would, I would, I would, I would look at you know, the marketing trends in two different ways. There's, there's, there's a philosophical side of things and then there's the core technology that goes behind it. On the philosophical side, Dilshad, the biggest thing that has happened in the last decade or so is this notion of noise. The amount of noise that exists in all channels, all media channels across the board is so high that this concept of breakthrough has become next to impossible to achieve without really an unbelievable amount of spend. Like I'll, I'll, I'll give you a very simple example. Last year, the total cloud spend, mm -hmm. the spend on cloud technology in media, in the US alone, right, was uh, close to $220 million. Um, uh, Microsoft, mm -hmm. Amazon, Google, those were three of the largest companies, and IBM, four of the largest companies. In order to truly get breakthrough in some of those markets, you had to spend over $30 million. That's one category. For a company that has a complex set of services, just think about what that implication is. So the noise level is incredibly high. To achieve breakthrough, this notion of experience mm -hmm. is what is philosophically in my mind, the biggest marketing trend that's happening. And what I mean by that is how do you connect physical and digital? Post-COVID, we have seen an incredible rise in physical. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody wants to come back together. People After are being enjoying. being deprived for so many exactly. years. The fidgetal experience. Yeah, yeah. That, that fidgetal experience, but connecting those two experiences becomes really, really critical. So philosophically, just providing an experience that spans both the physical world and digital world is something that is the holy grail mm -hmm. of marketing. From a technology angle, right, biggest elephant in the room, generative AI. Absolutely. Generative AI is having and is going to have an absolutely profound impact uh, on marketing in a really, really good way. Mm -hmm. I'm excited about it uh, personally. Like, just if you will see the manifestations, and we are just scratching the surface at this point in time, like one of the latest trends uh, around uh, social is that the algorithms for LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, all of them have fundamentally changed. The algorithms much more favor user-generated content now. So company handles and things like that don't get broadcast as much, but user-generated content gets broadcast in a big way. So understanding the change in the algorithm and coming up with ideas of how do you tackle that, that's something generative AI mm -hmm. can uh, truly help you with. So generative AI, I think, is is here. Mm -hmm. It's there to stay. There's no question about it. And it's going to have a profound impact on how marketing is done, including the connection of that physical and digital. And digital. So those technologies are maturing in a very, very big mm -hmm. way. So mm -hmm. lots of stuff going on in marketing. You know, which uh, can be overwhelming for a lot of marketers as well, which we've seen. And that's mm -hmm. exactly where I was going to go, Dilshad, mm -hmm. because look, it's easy to sit there and get excited about mm -hmm. each of these technologies, right? But you have to first ensure that your intake process can actually handle that amount of data, mm -hmm. make sense of that data, so the actions coming out of it 
bear the right results. So this notion of a CDP, a customer data platform, mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. been around for a long time yes. now, right? It's now more important than any any time mm -hmm. before. Context and relevance, I think, two key things, of course. And because you mentioned Gen AI, let me just get into uh, get into that a little bit because we've seen, of course, a we're seeing a hype cycle. We're also seeing a fear cycle. Um, and so in my conversations with a lot of people, especially global CMOs, they're very excited like you about generative AI and the impact it can have on augmenting a lot of the things that marketers are doing. But um, there's something also interesting there because I heard uh, a few people talking about, especially on maybe the creative and content side of things, that it could perhaps democratize mediocrity. Um, and so is that for you as a marketer uh, something that you pay attention to? You seem a lot more optimistic than a lot of people that I've spoken to. Um, what are your thoughts on that? So right off the bat, I'm 100% in the optimistic camp, mm -hmm. right? I think if you look at the evolution of technology, the evolution of technology suggests that for decades it was the humans that were trying to learn computers. Now, if you see what's happened with yeah. generative AI, it is exactly the reverse. Mm -hmm. It's computers trying to learn humans. That's one aspect as, 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 as background to my answer. The second aspect to background to my answer is this notion that what the human brain can do in a footprint, in a muscle that's as large as your and my head, the amount it takes to be able to do that from a generative AI standpoint, when that footprint comes down to this footprint, that's when I would be concerned and I might not be as optimistic. <laughs> I think that's a long ways mm -hmm, away. Mm -hmm. So just putting those into context, this notion that you mentioned of there is fear that generative AI could potentially die, uh, drive mediocrity. I think I 100% agree to that. Mm -hmm. If you think generative AI is the answer to all of your questions. Mm -hmm. And I, where, what I am a strong believer in is where magic is going to occur is at the intersection of generative AI and human intelligence, mm -hmm. human creativity human original thought. And I think that model is the model that we have to strive for. This notion that generative AI can undertake and perform every task to the same level of efficiency, I think that is the flawed notion here. When people think about generative AI today, their first thought goes to a robot that's taking over all the functions. Mm -hmm. And I don't believe that. And I know that I'm optimistic because my model is humans and computers working together to solve the problem, mm -hmm. not computers taking over the whole mm -hmm, thing. Mm -hmm. That's good news for a lot <laughs> of us. But let me come back to your um, a point about the digital experience and how important it is, of course, you know, post-COVID, like you mentioned. Tell me some about some of the things that Cognizant has done, perhaps, in these past couple of years that exemplify this approach that you said when it comes to the, phys uh, the digital experiences, the brand experiences, and then, of course, taking those experiences back with you. How is Cognizant doing it? Can you give me a few examples? And a follow-up question to that, uh, I'll ask you again when we get to it, is then how do you sort of measure the impact, effectiveness, and success of those campaigns versus perhaps some of the other workaday campaigns, initiatives that you have running? Yeah, so uh, example, I'll, I'll, I'll give you one example. So one of the things, because you know uh, the type of services, uh, the type of services that we sell, we predominantly work with G2000 accounts across the, uh, across the globe. One of the things with the G2000 accounts is if you look at the C-level, there's a limited number of C-level across those accounts. So if I take approximately 10 personas per company mm -hmm. in 2,000 companies, right? That's 20,000 personas that I'm interested in and I'm trying to influence right from CEOs to chief revenue officers to line of business leaders to CIOs and all of those roles, right? So obviously one of, one of the places where we focus heavily is this notion of account-based marketing and persona-based marketing, mm -hmm. right? And um, one of the elements of that is, okay, now, I have a persona that I'm, I'm, I'm going to target. Can I learn something about that persona 
from the perspective of his or her likes or dislikes, uh, interests, all of that kind of stuff, right? So, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to reveal the client, but I'll, I'll, I'll give you a real example that happened uh, two, three years ago when we first got into the relationship with Formula One. Mm -hmm. Formula One was not as popular in the United States, right? Drive to Survive was just starting the Netflix series. Uh, people were just getting acquainted with it. So you had some diehard fans that have mm -hmm. always watched the sport, but a lot of the new generations had not really watched the sport and did not know. And we looked at, we looked at, there was one particular account we were going after. They're based out of Dallas, Texas. Uh, and one of the personas was really critical. It was a business owner. Uh, one of those personas were really critical. And I had my team look like we do in all ABM accounts. We look at what are their interests, what are their likes, dislikes, all of that kind of stuff. Is there anything we can learn about mm -hmm. them? Obviously, we talk to our sales teams about them too, because they have a inherent understanding of that client. And one of the things we figured out was the person had two or three cars. Mm -hmm. They were really interested in racing, right? So we reached out and, and this was an acquisition account. This was not an account we had worked with. So this intelligence was not gathered through mm -hmm. our sales guys. This intelligence was gathered purely from a social standpoint uh, and those elements, right? Uh, we reached out to this gentleman, right? That was the right persona at this company that we're targeting and we we, we invited them to the race in Austin. At that point in time in the US, you only had the race in Austin. Mm -hmm. Miami, Vegas had not opened up, but we invited. So here's a classic example of how we approached the problem digitally, find out, found out some information about a person that we were trying to target and then invited to a physical event, mm -hmm. right? So that experience of us and in in we were open about it like because the gentleman asked mm -hmm. afterwards like how did you why know? and how <laughs> so we said this is how we did it mm -hmm. and he's like mm -hmm. you know it's when 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 a, and and he came out to austin he thoroughly enjoyed the race he was not in F1 at mm -hmm. that point in time. Mm -hmm. Now he's the biggest F1 fan. <laughs> he follows the Aston Martin team all the time. Mm -hmm. He's joined us for a couple of other races and he's had a blast, mm -hmm. right? And he's a large customer, most importantly. Mm -hmm. He's a large customer of Cognizant mm -hmm. right now. But there's an example, simple example of how you have a digital aspect and you get something out of the digital footprint. You correlate yeah. that to physical experiences you can build. Mm -hmm. You join the two together and the experience ends up being incredible for that person and incredibly uh, useful for Cognizant as a company mm -hmm. too. Because you, you started the conversation talking about F1 and racing. Let's talk about, of course, the association and partnership with an iconic brand, an iconic team, Aston Martin. Tell me a little bit about the genesis of that partnership, uh, what Cognizant is doing, how that, how that sort of task has evolved over the years. and. Let's also talk about, of course, the Netflix series, Drive to Survive. It's changed the game for the sport, of course, viewers, as well as the brands associated with different teams and overall with, with F1. So uh, tell me about this evolution, starting with the partnership. Yeah, so, so you know, when I joined Cognizant, which is around a little over four years ago, uh, we'd never done any major sports sponsorships or any elements like that. And one of the ways to get a strong message across, sports can be an incredibly viable engine to be able to do that. But proven, then you have to- Absolutely proven, yeah. Uh, and it's proven, exactly. Mm -hmm. But then you have to go into the first part of the conversation, which is which sports are truly conducive mm -hmm. to technology? And where can technology make a very obvious difference in that sport? And we looked at, I, 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 I remember this, I, I remember <laughs> this distinctly. We looked at 40 different mm -hmm. sports, tennis and marathons included. Mm -hmm. We looked at 40 different types of sports and um, looking at the global nature mm -hmm. of Formula One and the tech conduciveness of motorsports, right? We locked on Formula One. Then came the decision of do you want to partner with the team or do you partner with the governing body and all. And we went through our trials and tribulations mm -hmm. of all of that and we landed in the end uh, on Aston Martin, which was an incredible, has, has been an incredible journey for us and the team themselves. But 
the tech induce, uh, conduciveness part is probably one of the most critical because you get to tell the story mm -hmm. of why did you pick this specific team, this specific sport. Um, so you have IoT sensors. Mm -hmm. They are uh, sending information in real time back to the garage and to head office in Silverstone. Garage and head office are talking together. They're talking to the driver and that nexus in real time. forms the decision that the driver makes on when to come in for a pit mm -hmm. stop, for example. Now imagine the technology, right from the network to the data gathering, to the assimilation of the data and figuring out what that insight is mm -hmm. that the driver can use to get a competitive advantage. That's one example that is track side. It's happening during the race, so we call it track side. Mm -hmm. Another great example of something similar like that, but not track side, is fan engagement. Yes. One of the biggest deals around these Formula One teams is their merchandising. Mm -hmm. And how do they get a greater set of fans? How do they sell more merchandise? So we help with that aspect too. The digital app, the, the, the algorithms, mm -hmm. and solving for those algorithms so that Aston Martin's message is reaching the right audience that's very conducive to that message and ready to engage with it. All of those elements is another piece mm -hmm. where, you know, the sport is incredibly technology conducive. So those are certain elements of a big reason where we could show, like, just, 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 just think about this simple notion that if we can help this decision making mm -hmm. happen, at 300 kilometers per hour. <laughs> can you imagine mm -hmm. what we can do to a retailer, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Just, it's that notion that is really powerful. you put powerful. it that way, absolutely. Yeah. And it's interesting because you mentioned earlier to me that you actually sort of signed on for that just um, just before the, the show was gonna happen or and was mid-COVID, post a little bit, yeah. During yeah, COVID, so it, yeah. it was the intersection of a couple of interesting mm -hmm. moments and one of the boldest moves, one of the mm -hmm. biggest risks we took, and it paid off, thankfully. Uh, but it was, it was, you know, around March of 2020 was when the uh, was when we all went into lockdown and all of that. That's when I started the conversation with Aston Martin. We ended the conversation around October mm -hmm. of 2020, and that's where we signed the deal without knowing. We were still not out of lockdown or anything like that, without knowing. But we guessed based on two things, which is one, by that point in time, six months into it, um, an introvert like me wanted to go out and meet mm -hmm. people, mm -hmm. <laughs> which basically told me <laughs> there's a lot of people willing to get uh, uh, around with each other, right? Mm -hmm. That was one uh, thing that we bet on. The second thing we bet on was the sport because we had heard of the Netflix Drive to Survive and our bet was just humanizing the sport mm -hmm. and showing the different aspects of the sport, right from drivers to team principles, to the technology, to things like that, and educating people about the sport is gonna be a phenomenal thing which has never been done before. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's the second thing we bet on.